Hi folks, I'm Kira Kazanzas from Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Um, welcome again and thank you all for stepping up to help with the vaccine effort. Um, on behalf of SVCN and Cadre, I'd also like to thank the very hardworking folks at Public Health Department and the county's EOC because they're going to provide a bunch of expertise today. And they're also been working arm in arm with numerous stakeholders to provide equitable vaccine distribution. Uh, some more thanks. I'd like to thank the um, Public Health Department and Supervisor Chavez um, because, because thanks to them, there are already a number of nonprofit organizations who are doing yeoman's work and reaching their communities. Uh, they're registering folks. And in the case of our stellar community clinics, they're also administering the vaccine. Uh, thanks also to the city of San Jose. I think someone's here from city, um, which also jumped in with both feet to support the vaccine effort. The purpose of this training is to activate the larger nonprofit community. And today you're going to hear from some incredible leaders who are already doing this work to provide insight into how you can talk to your clients, constituents, and community partners about the vaccine, and you can provide them with needed information so you can be an effective vaccine advocate. And to talk a little bit more about the current need, I'd like to invite Michelle Liu, the CEO of the Health Trust, to say a few words about that. Thanks so much, Kira. And thank you to SBCN and to Cadre for your tireless work, although you're probably pretty tired, but just your 24-7 work during the pandemic. Uh, it's been a way longer journey than any of us hoped, but uh, we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. So some of the good news that we heard last week, uh, Dr. Marty Fenstersheim from the county shared that over a million county residents have been vaccinated. That's great news. The less good news, as Dr. Marty put it, is that the first million to get vaccinated, that was the easy population. It's the next group that will be more challenging to vaccinate. For example, we still have not hit the 50% mark in the Latino community for vaccinations. This is why you and the nonprofit sector are so important. You are the people that our clients trust. You and your nonprofits are the places where people turn, even when they rightfully fear the government, elected officials, and other people who are urging them to get vaccinated. Thanks to you and the trust that you've built, the relationships you have, the sensitivity and the compassion that you bring to this work, you are the ones who have the power to help all of our community get vaccinated. So today is really about rolling up our sleeves. I know we're tired, but we need to be our nonprofit -y, persuasive, creative, innovative selves and really be a shot in the arms for people so that we get our full community vaccinated. Thanks so much for being here. I'm gonna turn the program over to Anna. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anna Swardensky with Cadre, and um, we're going to get underway with a couple of housekeeping remarks. Um, part of our goal always is to encourage relationship building and networking. So if you wouldn't mind in the chat box, if you could put your name and your organization. If you'd like to change your Zoom window um, introduction, if you want to put your first name and your agency, if you have preferred pronouns, uh, you're welcome to list it there in your Zoom window. Uh, we are going to be using the chat box and the raise hand feature for today's session. Everyone is on mute, um, so we actively encourage you to enter your questions or comments in the chat box and use the raise hand feature if you'd like to speak aloud or you can message me directly as the coordinator host. Um, we also have a couple of accessibility features running. Uh, we are running Zoom live transcription. Uh, if that's in your control panel for Zoom, we are also offering Otter AI transcription as a separate browser window. So if you'd like to take advantage of that or prefer that method, you're welcome to use that. It's in the upper left corner of your screen, a drop down menu that says live on Otter AI will open up a separate browser window. Uh, the other accessibility request we have for you is when you are speaking, if you can please start with your name, that helps for those folks that are following along with live transcription. The example of that would be before you start your remarks, this is Anna, and I'd like to add dot, dot, dot. Um, so let's get on um, with our program today. If you have any questions, I am listed hopefully at the top of your participant list under access coordinator dash Anna. So feel free to message me directly. Um, the ses 
session objectives were pretty much covered by Kira and Michelle. Thank you very much. They're just up on your screen as a quick review. And in terms of how today's program is laid out, we're finishing up our welcome and introductions. I'll be momentarily introducing our first two speakers from the county. You'll have a brief opportunity for some Q&A. Uh, and then we have a wonderful panel of speakers that Nick Kawada has lined up. Uh, to share with you their expertise on reaching diverse communities. And we'll close out today's program with a few requests and comments from our County Public Health Department, Jennifer. Um, with that, let's uh, go ahead and get underway. I do need to switch um, PowerPoint decks. So let me introduce um, Brian Darrow with the County Office, uh, Santa Clara County Executive's Office. He is the Vaccine Outreach Branch Director for our Emergency Operations Center. And also Jennifer Gakutan Galang from our County Public Health Department, who serves as the co-coordinator for our Community Stakeholder Working Group. Jennifer and Brian, if you want to go ahead and take it away, I'll get your PowerPoint up in just a moment. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Through the mask. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it's harder to hear through the mask, but um, thank you. First, just a big thank you for, for having me today. Um, I did want to start by, Michelle actually covered some of this, but wanted to share a, a quick update on the status of vaccinations in our county. Overall, the news has been, so if you go to the next slide, um, so overall, and sorry, that's a little fuzzy, but the news has been pretty positive when you look at the totality of the situation. We now have, as you can see there, more than 73% of our 16 and older population who have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Uh, and this is one of the highest rates in the state. So we're closing in on 1.2 million residents who've received their first shot. And just a couple of days ago, the share of residents over 16 who, who have gotten fully vaccinated is over 50% now. So we're, we've definitely been heading in the right direction. That's the really good news. The more challenging news, as Michelle was mentioning, is that demand has now started to decline significantly. So whereas just a few weeks ago, we didn't have nearly enough vaccine to meet the demand, we now have more than enough supply and not enough residents and workers eager to get the vaccine. Just today at our county health system sites, we had, at least as of this morning, we had 7,000 appointments that were still available for someone to book just for today if they wanted to get in uh, to get their first dose. And, and uh, so again, as Michelle was sort of indicating that that first group, the first 1 million or 1.2 million was the easy part. And it's this next uh, next group that is going to be more challenging because we're talking about the folks who are not as eager to rush in and get vaccinated. So whether there's whether that's due to um, uh, hesitancy or whether it's due to access challenges or whether it's due to other barriers, it's it's a group that we know is is very important to make make sure we can um, uh, provide vac vaccination, but is also just going to take more effort. So we definitely need your help, uh, and and some of that is just your help letting the community know that that getting vaccinated is important, but some of it is just letting folks know that it's very easy now. Um, and, and again, that changed recently. So, I mean, a, a good message that we've been trying to put out there is it takes less than five minutes to register. Um, we have a lot of outreach workers who are helping people register in the community and if and that's through an online portal, but if it, someone can, can go online themselves, uh, it is a very quick process. We also have, um, you know, phone numbers for folks to call and the wait times on the phone have come down quite a bit too since demand has has um, started to wane. Uh, wait times at our actual sites are much shorter as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about how you can uh, connect community members to, to how they get vaccinated in, in a second. Before I move to the next slide though, I, Michelle was hitting on this as well, but, and I know our panel later will talk about it, but what isn't reflected in this slide is are the disparities that we see in terms of vaccination rates. Um, equity has been a really central part of the county's response and, and the response of so many partners, many of whom are on the phone. Um, and, and we've seen, but we've seen throughout the pandemic that it, COVID did not impact uh, different communities equally. So we, we know that there's both heavier impacts geographically in East San Jose and South County, and in terms of race and ethnicity for our 
Latino and um, African African ancestry communities. And we've, we've also seen vaccination rates a little bit lower in those areas at times. But the good news has been among the older, um, 50 and older population, that equity gap has really started to narrow, um, actually closed al almost, um, we have, we have a, almost no gap in terms of uh, our wh white residents, Latino residents and African African ancestry residents if, with older, with the 50 and older population. That isn't as true when you look across the board. So there's still more work to do, but a lot of the efforts that folks on the phone have put into this have, have been making a difference. I just wanted to lead with that. Next slide, please. So why is it important for our residents and workers to get vaccinated? Well, vaccines are our best tool to fight the spread of COVID-19. They are very effective. We see it here, we, we saw it from the clinical trials, but we also see it in terms of how our community is doing with COVID now. Um, more and more people are now out and about. Uh, folks have probably noticed uh, there's just more activity happening, but we've been able to keep our case rate relatively low despite that increased activity. And I, I think it, that is undoubtedly somewhat linked to vaccination uptake and how many folks have actually gotten vaccinated. So uh, it's been working. Um, but we're not close to, you know, we're, we're not at or even really that close yet to herd immunity, although that is a moving target, like the, the number, there's no magic number of what, what um, community immunity is, but there's certainly more we need to do. As I mentioned, we're, we're only just above halfway through the 16 and older population being fully vaccinated. So there is still a lot of work, but um, the other, you know, the other thing I wanted to flag about the importance of getting vaccinated is the, uh, the experience from India kind of shows us this, the awful experience happening in other parts of the world right now is that we're, we're far from out of the woods with the virus and it's a bit of a race um, between us getting vaccinated and variants potentially developing. So we don't wanna give the virus any more of a chance, any more opportunity to mutate and to become potentially more um, harmful or more resistant to vaccines. So far, the the variants seem um, the vaccines seem to work well on on the variants that are out there. But you don't want to give more time uh, than necessary to the to those um, possibilities. And and so it's just so so critical that everybody get vaccinated. No one wants to return to where we started um, with the pandemic. So those are some reasons, obviously, to get vaccinated. Next slide. I did wanna share a few of the common misconceptions that, or concerns that we hear in the outreach efforts we're doing. I'm most involved in our field outreach program. So that again is a, um, a number of community partners who are doing door-to-door -door outreach, who are doing outreach at businesses or uh, tabling at grocery, outside of grocery stores and a, a lot of other events to try to sign people up for vaccination appointments and just do basic um, vaccine education. And some of the things that we hear through that work are on the slide here. So folks feeling like I've already had COVID, so I'm, I'm protected. I don't need to get um, vaccinated. Well, um, the reality is the, the vaccine actually gives you much stronger immunity from COVID-19 than having had COVID itself. There's been a number of studies on this now. Um, a recent one showed that people have vaccinated people actually have up to 10 times the um, number of antibodies, antibody levels uh, in their body than someone who just had COVID. So we try to let the community know that. Uh, some folks express concern about missing work um, and which makes complete sense. The good news on that front is that the state did pass a law requiring uh, any large employer to provide supplemental paid sick leave, both to get your vaccination and if you were to have side effects, which side effects can last for a day or two, that's not uncommon, um, but that supplemental sick leave or requirement for paid sick leave is for anyone who works at a company with 26 or more employees. So that is, I don't think as well known as we want it to be. Um, and then we have this phone number here from our Office of Labor Standards Enforcement. If anyone is, if, if anyone's rights with regard to that sick leave are not being um, uh, adhered to. So that phone number we try to get out there. Another common issue that has come up lately, and I don't know where this myth started, but it's that the vaccine may cause infertility issues. And there's no evidence of that. Um, in fact, there isn't any evidence actually that any vaccines, so that includes the COVID vaccines, cause fertility problems, but it has been something we've been hearing lately. 
So we try to just um, let folks know there's no, there, that is, that is a, a myth that has come out of essentially social media. Um, and a lot of the folks we talk to are not, uh, are not um, strong, they're not deeply ingrained with these beliefs. It's just something that they've heard. And so when we can sort of provide the information that no, there isn't evidence of that, it is a myth that's been floating out there, but the CDC's looked at it there and, and that isn't, isn't true, that, that does help, we've found. And then there's some other issues here, um, you know, being afraid of the long-term impacts of the vaccine. We try to emphasize with folks that the, the, the side effects are very short-term if they happen at all. On the other hand, COVID has re major risk for long-term impacts. And so it, some of this is just about re-emphasizing that, that the risk that COVID presents uh, because it's you know, it's a it, virus that we've learned more and more about, but we is still a little mysterious and can affect anyone. Um, you know, it does tend to affect um, older residents more, but younger residents have have suffered major consequences. So it's it's a bit random, and it it, it is much more of a risk, and much more of a long term risk than the vaccine. And then, you know, we hear about um, oh, fetal tissue is, is in the vaccine. That's, th there are no fetal cells or tissue of any kind in the vaccine. There was um, some old cell lines used to develop uh, the J&J &J vaccine, but there's no tissue, there's no fetal cells in those vaccines. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time there, but uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, one other common thing we hear is that um, the vaccine was developed uh, too fast, and there's a fear that that means it isn't safe. The truth is that, um, that none of the usual steps in the vaccine approval process were skipped, none. So what happened is that the processes that normally occur in sequential order were done at the same time. So the big issue was that manufacturing of the vaccine started while the clinical trials were still underway, and that is unusual but it really allowed us to begin putting shots in arms as soon as the FDA and CDC um, authorization came through. So that did speed things up a lot and it seemed pretty unique, but the, it, was, it was to match the unique moment that we're in. And so obviously the, the federal government, the FDA and CDC really prioritized the review and author authorization, but that's why we were able to get these vaccines so quickly. It wasn't that steps were skipped. Next slide. And these are just a few other frequently asked questions. We, I won't go into these, but there's, we also on our um, website have a lot of frequently asked questions that can be helpful uh, that are common. Next slide. I did wanna just talk briefly about, so the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine was paused briefly. Uh, it was paused to look into what turned out to be an extremely rare side effect, uh, blood clots. And after looking into that, the, the federal government and independent public health doctors determined that the benefits of the, that vaccine really did far outweigh the, um, the drawbacks. And so there, there were a, a, a few cases, I think it was 15 cases last I saw in late, late April that had had this issue. So not, um, you know, not no one, but it was it, it really a very small fraction of the millions of shots that had been administered. And it was, uh, and so anyway, I just wanted to call people's attention that we have resources, fact sheets on our website of, about the J&J &J vaccine and about the um, resuming of the use of that. And, and one final thing to flag, we are offering at the county sites, uh, it's sort of an opt-in. If you come to the county sites, the assumption is you're, you'll be getting either Pfizer or Moderna. But if on site, if you want the one shot J&J uh, &J vaccine, that is an option uh, and you can definitely have it. And all of our mass vaccination sites the big one, you know, the fairgrounds, Levi's Stadium, uh, our site at Burger, and I'll show those sites in a second. All of those are offering J and J as an option, and most of our mobile clinics are now op offering it as an as an option too. So we're trying to give folks a couple of different uh, avenues. Next slide. And how, uh, Anna? Am I okay on time? Do I have a couple? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to call people's attention to our website, uh, sccfreevax.org, which is a, the best tool for figuring, for just quickly directing folks to how to get vaccinated. If you click on that book an appointment button on the far, on the bottom left corner, this is just the, the top of the page there, that will send you to a part of the page that show that has a, uh, about a bunch of different providers. So it has the link to the county website, to Kaiser, to Stanford, to El Camino, to um, 
Veterans Affairs to all the pharmacies, the far, you know, the retail pharmacies like CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, many of those locations, even Safeway and Costco, many of those locations are now providing vaccinations. So there's a link there that will send you actually to, to um, the method through which you can you can book an appointment at those sites. We also now on our website have a list of all of the drop-in sites that the county is involved in and actually some of our community partners are offering. So there's, in addition to being able to book an appointment, there's more and more opportunities for just dropping in and getting a, an appoint, uh, getting a vaccine without an appointment. So those are all listed on our website too. Next slide. Um, so again, I, I already sort of went over this, uh, that the vax.sccgov.org website is, is if you wanna book directly with the county and that can be a pretty good shortcut just to get right into those um, nine uh, mass vaccination sites that the county has um, spread out throughout Santa Clara County. Um, next slide. And these are our website is a is actually five websites. It's in five different languages. It's uh, updated regularly. Uh, so Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Tagalog, and English. I did want to call out our phone number for booking vaccine appointments. Uh, this is our Valley Connections line, 408-970-2000. Um, and again, that the wait times on that phone number have really come down. Uh, so it's a good way with a lot of language accessibility on that phone number too, if you don't, if folks don't want to book online or can't book online. Next slide. This is a quick um, run through of our large sites. So the appointment-based sites, uh, and you'll see some of the hours there, we've expanded our weekend and uh, evening hours. Uh, so the fairground site is going until 8 p.m. a couple nights a week. Our Levi Stadium site is seven days a week and several evening hours. The Emmanuel Baptist Church site in East San Jose is now going till 6 p.m. Uh, the Valley Specialty Center um, on the VMC campus uh, goes goes until it's actually 7.30. It says seven there, but it's actually 7.30 Monday through Friday. And then we have um, our mobile teams now are able we have a dedicated mobile team that is rotating and, and Monday through, or some day, it's usually four days a week, it's providing evening hours at, at various sites. So again, that can be found on our website that as the sites change. I did wanna call out that Gardner for a long time has been providing great, a great clinic at the Mexican Heritage Plaza on Tuesday through Wednesday. And then Stanford in partnership with the county, the county leases the space from Eastridge Mall, but they have a clinic at the Aloha Roller Rink at Eastridge, it's seven days a week. It allows drop-ins and appointments um, and you can see the hours there. So that's a good option as well. Uh, and then I'll wrap up pretty soon. Next slide. Oh, two more quick things. So uh, for we really have been trying to remove barriers uh, for you know, whatever the barrier is that someone has, we're trying their, our best to provide different levels of service to try to meet people where they are. One of those programs is our in-home vaccination program. And so residents can email that email address or call the phone number on the screen to request an in-home vaccination. Uh, we do have an, some eligibility criteria, but it's, it's gotten a lot less strict actually. We're, um, most of the folks who, who we've talked to are deemed eligible. And what happens is we send a team out in partnership with city and county fire, uh, depending on the location. Uh, so the fire departments have been extremely helpful and we go to folks home and we vaccinate them. And if they have someone in their household who isn't, so the individual who is, um, you know, can't leave the home and get vaccinated, if they have a family member who can leave the home but hasn't been vaccinated, we will vaccinate them too, just because we're there. <laughs> so just something to know, it's a, it, that is a resource and these phone, that phone number is a good way to, to um, contact us. And then the next slide, I think is my final slide. And this, I wanted to let folks know, we have a partnership now. Thank you to VTA. Um, thank you to MV Transit, their paratransit provider. And thank you to Working Partnerships. Um, we've been partnering on a program that is a door-to-door -door transportation service. So if you need a vaccine appointment and, you, and, your, and transportation is your barrier, VTA Paratransit will now pick pick up pick that individual up from anywhere in the county. So you have to be in Santa Clara County as your starting point. But they will take them to their vaccination site. They will wait for them there and then provide the return trip. There's no cost. Uh, the vehicles are accessible, and anyone um, again, it's it's a lower eligibility threshold, but it's anyone who has a transportation barrier. 
And the way to request that service is the working partnerships can resource hotline. The phone number is there. So I will hand it over to Jen Jennifer with the next slide. Great. Thank you, Brian. So what I wanted to share with all of you, I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Um, this is a link to where we keep all of our vaccine resources. So next slide, Anna. So after you click on this slide, it's going to take you to our homepage. And this is what it looks like. When you get the slides, the, the link is up top for you. So you have um, access to the link after this event is over. So you'll see there are folders here. Most of them are in different languages. So we do offer our resources in these different languages. There are some other folders here that we'll go over. Um, next slide. So if you've not used Google Drive, the way I have mine set up is in list view, so I can see in a list all the names of the folders, but you can also change it to grid view using um, that icon there in the corner. Next slide. So this is in the English folder. So if we just clicked on the English folder, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see print, weekly schedule, and vaccine um, clinic flyers, vaccine 101 presentations, videos, and social media. Next slide. So if we just clicked into the print folder, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see a list of all the handouts that we've provided. And everything that is in our Google Drive has been requested from community members just like you. So our stakeholder working group members, when we ask them, what materials do you need in order to outreach for the vaccine? This is what they've told us. So you'll see that these are the things that they've listed here. Um, again, if you've not used Google Drive, next slide. This is where you can um, toggle to go um, sort from last modified to newest on top. So the slide before that, but it, it's, um, it's an arrow right before, right here. So if you wanna see what we have just recently modified and the communications team is constantly modifying these, that's how you can see how to do it. And then the, the slide that you had after that, Anna, this is if you wanna do grid view. If you can't remember the title of a handout we had produced, but you remember what it looks like, this might help you find it. So if you click on grid view, you can see a um, little picture. Next slide. So again, we're back in our English folder. So something I did want to point out to you is our vaccine 101 folder. So if you click on that and go on the next slide, this is what it looks like. So we have actual PowerPoint presentations on Vaccine 101. So if that's so you can educate yourself a little bit more on vaccines or you wanna educate the community that you're working with, here are some slides that you can use. And these again are um, constantly updated when new things arise. Next slide. Back into the main folder. Something I did want to call out is our vaccine testimonials. So if you click on that folder, it'll take you to the next slide and it will look like this. So we have a folder for social media, a folder for prints, and a folder for videos. If you click on um, social media, which is the next slide, this is what it's going to take you to. So when we ask the stakeholders, how do you want us to deliver messages? What they said to us was, you need to use the voices and the faces of actual and real community members, right? Don't take stock photos of people that you think look like our community. We want you to use our community. So we did. We reached out to over 40 nominees to our vaccine testimonial campaign. We took their photo, we interviewed them, and we pulled quotes. And we've put together posters and social media, um, like you can see here. If you want to order posters, you can order posters from us for free. We have 11 by 17, as well as um, eight and a half by 11. Uh, just let us know if, if you want any of those and that we will get these printed for you. But these social media posts are ready to be posted on any of the social media platforms you're using. So hopefully we're making it easy for you to use. And then next slide. This link here, when you get the slide deck, will take you to the YouTube playlist where we have all of our videos. So you'll see here, we have right now uploaded 33 videos. More are coming and we have them in different languages and we have them in different lengths too. So we have three minute videos and we have 36 second videos, but hopefully this is where you can hear from 
um, the actual community member themselves why they decided to get vaccinated or why they plan to get vaccinated. And then this video here is um, Iris, and I have the link there for her video if you want to watch it. But that's a quick run through of our Google Drive and all the information that we have that you can use. Okay, well, thank you to both Brian and Jennifer. At this time, um, we've allotted a few moments. If you had any questions uh, that you wanted to ask our public health department and our emergency operations center vaccine outreach team, uh, a number of you have entered questions in as part of your registration uh, for today. And so if you haven't heard the answer to your question on where you find the resources or you have specific questions about kind of the, the vaccine itself, now would be your time to ask those. Our next segment is gonna focus on our outreach efforts with different populations. So we know we had questions directed at those speakers, but if you have a question, uh, you are welcome to put it in the chat right now or raise your, use your raise hand feature and I'll try and see if I can catch you. Um, Leah is asking, what can be done to encourage members of target communities to volunteer with the vaccine effort? Is that something that Jennifer or Brian wanna try and address? And maybe our speakers that are about to speak could also give that some thought if you're gonna be addressing that as well. Yeah, we, you know, we've actually had a great volunteer um, a lot, great level of interest among volunteers, and we've 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 throughout the pandemic have seen a, a ton of uh, folks come out and volunteer. And we have a volunteer um, portal on our website. We've lately we've actually had more more folks than we could handle. Uh, that said, the there it remains a need for uh, as far as at last at last I heard there um, remains a need for volunteers in South County, and we all always can use folks who are, bi are, are um, bilingual, um, particularly Spanish and, uh, and Vietnamese and, and our other threshold languages. So that is, um, I, can, I can check in with our volunteer um, team to see kind of where things stand and what the best way to get connected is. But I, I think for, for most general volunteers at this point, at least with the county effort, we, we don't have as much of a need because we've had such a big level of interest but again if you're if you can make it to Gilroy or and or if you're um, bilingual that that those are really useful uh, traits okay thank you Brian and Jennifer put in the chat uh, the link for volunteering thank you Jennifer and um, there was one other question about if agencies want to use the flyers is there a place for them to add their own contact information oh you want to unmute Jennifer Yes, so the folder, the flyers that we do have in our Google Drive, they're in PDF. But if you do want to put your your own logo on it, then just let me know and I can get you um, a copy that you can change. I'm going to put my email address here in the chat. So if any other questions come up around vaccine, you can always um, email this inbox and it's either me, Brian, or, or a couple other people on our team, Ali Thompson. Um, who will get back to you. So we, someone will always get back to you if you email this um, inbox here. Okay, wonderful, Jennifer. All right, um, continue to use the chat box if you have any additional questions or direct message me and we'll come back to you. At this time, I'm gonna keep us moving forward and I'm gonna turn the program over to my colleague, Nick Kawada from Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits to run our next segment. Thanks, Anna. And, and thank you again to both Brian and Jennifer for all your continued work around uh, vaccinating our populations. You know, I believe um, one of the differences that our county has uh, taken in our approach is making this an equity centered approach. And, and that is uh, all the more important when it comes to getting um, the most hesitant, uh, the most unlikely to, to be notified uh, about uh, the vaccine. So I actually have a great panel of folks here today. Um, and, uh, oh, I should probably introduce who I am first. I am Nick Kawada. I'm the policy director for Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. And uh, I'm here today to, to let you uh, meet some of our, our great panelists. I'm going to give you a little briefer, their information, their bios were actually on the registration page. So 
apologies if you've heard this or read this already, but I did want to introduce them. So Kikoa Lopez Puguyo is a mixed race uh, Hawaiian Filipino from the islands of Oahu and a recent graduate with a master's in public health from the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health. He leads some of the critical vaccine and resource community outreach efforts across the Bay Area for the Regional Pacific Islander Task Force as a program coordinator. He is passionate about advocacy for health equity among all AA and PI subgroup communities, cultural competence, and grassroots community organizing. We also have uh, Jackie Franco, who's the co-owner of Meta, a worker-owned cooperative doing COVID work in the community. Jackie is leading the charge on the ground with Promotoras and serves in various uh, committees that are addressing the COVID issues and vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing in, in our populations. Uh, Perla Flores is the Division Director for Community Solutions Intimate Partner Abuse, Sexual Assault, and, and, me, and Human Trafficking Programs. She implemented uh, Promotorex programs at the agency to increase underserved and marginalized communities access to information and resources. We also have Adriana Marquez, who is the Prevention Program Supervisor at Community Solutions. She has been a part of the Agent Fair for four years and is very passionate about her work and feels blessed to be a part of the movement that will bring an end to gender-based violence. For the past month, in collaboration with the Department of Public Health, she has been leading a group of promotores in uh, South County uh, in the effort to facilitate vaccination registration to our underserved populations. We also have Andre Chapman uh, and, uh, is the, uh, uh, and, and is the founder and CEO of Unity Care. And Andre and Black organizations across the Bay Area have joined forces to create COVID-19 Black, which he will walk through the website today, a project that aims to help educate and protect African Americans through the pandemic. And uh, lastly, we have Tree Nguyen, who is the program manager of the Vietnamese American Roundtable. He has uh, worked with the Vietnamese American community in the Bay Area for over 10 years throughout various volunteering and organizing activities from campaigns such as the Census 2020 to programs like workers' rights training and events like the Lunar New Year Festival. Um, so today, uh, we're going to be calling on each individual panelist. Every panelist will have about five to seven minutes to discuss um, a, a basic set of questions that we have uh, a heavy interest in, in hearing from, from uh, these individual community members and how they're leading. So what I, we wanted to focus the uh, discussion today was around what messages resonate, especially with those that are hesitant to get vaccinated, what are some challenges and pitfalls when messaging, messaging to these communities, and what are some methodologies that work best? So, um, Andre, would you mind starting us off here? Sure. Uh, appreciate it, Nick. And um, it's almost, well, it is noon time, so happy lunch, everybody. Um, just a quick overview, and I'll go to our website, but um, I'm Andre Chapman, CEO of Unity Care. And, you know, about a year ago, when we saw COVID hit, um, you know, myself, in partnership with the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, decided to take a very aggressive stand to address the, the potential impact of COVID-19. Um, as many of you know, and I think, um, I think it was Brian who even said it, you know, many of our folks don't trust uh, mainstream media and they get their media through social networks, particularly in the African-American community. Government is one we don't trust because of the history of discrimination and the social inequalities. And when COVID hit, I want you guys to think about this for one second. Think about if you were in a 12 round boxing match and here comes COVID and it's a new boxer and it just knocked us out. And what we saw was the African-American community had the highest level of deaths um, uh, across the United States um, with the uh, impact of COVID because of all the social inequalities. And um, so what, I, what we decided to do was very quickly uh, pivot and bring together the community and launch an initiative called COVID-19 Black, uh, which is an educational campaign from trusted resources um, that showed positive imagery of African Americans, because oftentimes all you see on the, on the news is negative imagery, right? Um, but really focusing on a communication strategy to reduce the spread. Um, and the partnership has expanded, and obviously we're, we're working here um, uh, in our county right here with, and it's a collaborative between Roots, Ujima, African American Community Service Agency, and Unity Care to really get on the ground and make sure that we get information in the hands of the African ancestry community to help reduce the spread, but, but also deal with the myths and the fallacies. And so let me let me share my screen real quick. And again, this is a, you know, as as we heard, I think it was Nick said earlier, you know, this is, um, you know, the, the issue is, is how do we ensure that our communities are getting the right information? It's not, you know, convoluted, it's, it's not, that is culturally relevant, culturally competent, and it speaks to our community. So can everyone see this, what's on the screen? I hope everybody can see that. All right, so let me, um, 
I'm going to try to move this over here and resume share. All right. So what you have here, and this is called, it's COVID-19 Black. So particularly for staff, folks that are in the community, if you want to be in a place where, and we get it all the time, if you're at the barbershop, beauty salon, it doesn't matter. People are talking about, you know, not just COVID, but also about, I'm not taking the vaccines. And what I'm concerned with, and I've said this a lot in my community, um, is, is that, you know, we're seeing just this sense of comfortness around, oh, you know, this virus is behind us, but, but the reality of it is we're seeing more deaths today than we saw in the first, you know, the first half of the year when it comes to black and brown families, right? And so the last three months between December to March, the last data showed African-Americans are dying at double the rates. And so it's still out there. And so we have to be mindful that we are getting vaccinated and doing things to protect ourselves. So let me let me walk through this. So basically, and, and I will show one of the videos, but this is a, it's a, it's a great resource for communities. It begins with our, it, it talks about, you know, um, positioning ourselves as a video from people that have been impacted by COVID-19. So it's a great video. I'm not going to go in. It's about five minutes. And again, I know I only have about seven minutes to share, but it's a great video, particularly from the communities that look like us, that is talking about the impact of this virus. Um, as you go down, there's a lot of videos. Uh, when we launched this initiative, we did it with a town hall back in March of last year. So it talks about our crises. So let me go across the top. You go to our crises, it talks about the impact in the African ancestry community. Because again, um, you know, we all know the data. And this is just one of the social inequalities because of the history of, of racism that you know, has just landed so heavy on our communities. The black and brown communities, you know, again, this is this is like that 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 new boxer that entered the ring. So you go into crises. It talks about the crises. There's videos from you know Nadine Burks. There's a there's a videos from other experts. Um, again, I'm going to walk through this pretty quickly. Disparities is actually one of my favorite sections because this gives you some understanding of history. As we know, we were not really educated in our in our in our his, in our educational system about the generational history of racism. You know, it was white. It was whitewashed. It was watered down. So this gives you an understanding of the, you know, the the legacy of discrimination that is existing, that is perpetuating what we're seeing in the crises when it comes to COVID nineteen. Is what we call our backpacks of trauma. So if you click a backpack, if you go into health or housing and education, again, when we're dealing with families in our community. It's not just this one issue. Today it's COVID nineteen. Tomorrow it might be something else. Uh, this next section here is about our stories. And again, it's, it's imagery of positive folks, but then it talks about the people that have been impacted by the virus. So it's, a, it's again, it goes into a lot of videos. Again, I'm not gonna go through every one, but this is one of my favorite sections because this is what staff can use to empower themselves. This is called take action. And to take action is, is really about what do we now do about it? And if you go to the take action, um, it has information about the vaccines. Matter of fact, I'll show one quick video because this is a really good video that you can sit when you're sitting with someone in the community and they're not really sure they want to take it. This is really, I'll just show a quick- Hello, Black America. Brief one. And people who pay attention to what Black folks are doing. My name is W. Kamal Bell. There's good news out there. There's a COVID-19 vaccine. Yay! But the bad news is, as Black folks, it's hard to trust what's going on. So what do we do? Well, we turn to people we can All right, I'm going to stop there because I have a short time. And then here's another one. These are local docs right here from Valley Med, African-American doctors. And again, it's something that you guys should, should absolutely um, share with the community. I got vaccinated to keep people safe. There you All right. So again, I'm going to go on because that's short. But again, and this section also has a flyer that we hand out in the community. So the community is aware of the fallacies. So it's something you put in their hands so that they know. We pass this out to the community churches. Uh, we pass this out community at community centers. Again, it keeps people informed of the facts and the truths and the myths about the virus. Um, so again, and then it has information about, again, about the virus. How do you, how do you keep yourself safe? Um, are, there si are there side effects? It's an information um, portal. There's resources. You can find African-American-led African -led organizations under the resource category. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the last one because we just did a town hall event. This is called Get Involved. We just did a town hall event. We had over a thousand people attend. It was led, um, it was on March 25th. And these are all of the leading public health officials across the Bay Area, as well as African-American doctors, as well as African-American led organizations 
to again talk about specifically for our community what are the things that we need to do to protect ourselves and our loved ones and then there's a lot of videos in each one of the breakout rooms and again it's an information portal so let me stop there so if you want to get involved get involved with our initiative um what i always the community, let me stop the sharing, is that when there are questions uh, that people have, um, uh -oh. when there are questions that people have, what we try to do is take them to our website and we give them the information in their hand that will answer the questions uh, that they may be challenged with. So let me stop the share, if I can stop it here. Thanks, Andre. And, and sorry for rushing you. You've got such an incredible resource here. I really do encourage uh, folks to to check out uh, COVID Black. They've got incredible resources, like Andre has mentioned, that I think a lot of us could really utilize uh, when we're interacting with, with people. Because again, it, it's not just using stock footage, as Jennifer mentioned. It, it's getting real people, people who are impacted, uh, that really need to be telling the stories and we need to be hearing from them. So Andre, thank you for that. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, you know, acknowledge that, you know, we do have uh, some other great resources that we may not be able to share. One of them is actually from our next speaker, Tree. Uh, did you want to jump in here real quick? And then I'll share your, the link to that video uh, in, the, in the chat. Thank you, Nick. And uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Before I start, I just want to say that the county did a terrific and tremendous job with uh, COVID. And uh, for COVID, we found ourselves more often, like we just need to amplify the messages that the county put out. So good job to the public information office. Um, I'm going to share a little bit on what we do. Um, first of all, like um, I think uh, the first one you asked is messaging. For messaging, we borrow the same strategy we did for census. So like in the beginning, um, we just trying to put out the mass message, try, trying to reach as many people as possible. Um, when the uh, vaccine was in short, we um, we had we kept a, a, an eye on like where had the, the where people have vaccine and then just push it out as fast as possible. Like uh, go today to this location and you get in line and you you're gonna get your vaccine today. Um, and so right now we at the point where the general population is already vaccinated and we're trying to get to the hard to reach population then we have to hit them with like benefits, obligations, and responsibility. Um, so cater the message to the needs of the community. Um, that's the first thing. Um, and then going back to sharing the county message, always trying to add a personal message to the content. Um, I, I, we found that it's a must. Like you just say one or two lines, highlight what it's about. It's a must. Um, it, it reached a lot more people and your own audience see that they like it more. Um, and then uh, moving on to like strategies, um, there's a couple of things that we do. Um, first of all, like bringing it to them. Uh, right now we trying to get to the heart to reach population. So the by the end of July, uh, right now we're sending out people to go door to door canvas. And by the end of July, our goal is to reach 7,000 people. Um, we, we have two people right now going door to door. Um, second thing is ethnic media. So right now, VAR is working with seven Vietnamese radio stations and one Vietnamese TV station. They are airing out ads at least three times a day um, on, all, on, on different channels. Um, the, for the Vietnamese population, people still listen to radio, especially like all the population who's going to work. Um, so that's the only option. Um, they listen to AM radio. And so, so that is the, the biggest thing that uh, for Vietnamese population, you have to keep an, uh, keep an eye out for. Um, and thirdly, we try to incorporate a COVID message into everything we do. Um, just now we had a Black April commemoration event. It's, it's one of the biggest event for the Vietnamese population here. So um, in the event, we wanna highlight the impact of women. So we made a PSA with 14 Vietnamese American woman who works in the city, the county, and the state. I'll I'll give the link right here. I'll Nick already get me the link. I'll get the link to you guys. So that's that's the latest PSA that we made with all the Vietnamese women of the county, the city, and the state. And then going back a little bit, we had the Lunar New Year Festival, um, and we wanted to encourage the community to stay home. So we host the event online, and we made a bunch of different contests and stuff for people to 
to celebrate and participate at home online. They, people make video of how they celebrate um, the festival at home and then they can enter the contest, stuff like that. And then upcoming um, for the summer, we always have the SEED program, which is the Student Engagement in Education Development Program. So this year, um, so the, go ahead a little bit about the program. Uh, we try to teach the student about the um, issues that, that their community faces and how to overcome the challenges. So this year, we're going to focus on the vaccine. And we're going to challenge the students to convince their Republican elders to take the vaccine. That, that leads to the third point, um, like the challenges that our community face. Um, you guys probably know that uh, half of the Vietnamese population here are diehard Republicans. Um, you probably saw the South Vietnamese flag at the insurrection at the Capitol building. Um, not our proudest moment. So that is our biggest challenge that um, a good number of our population is uh, diehard Republican. And um, right now we're, we're working on that. So our, our plan is to make it a challenge to the students, as I mentioned, and uh, we're still thinking of more strategy to uh, convince them. Yeah. Thank you, Nick and everyone. Thank you, Tree, and, and thank you for highlighting, you know, the complexities about a community. It's not, you know, just monolithic, right? There are many different layers to the community that we need to discuss, and it's not as simple as just saying, well, it's a vaccine, and science says so, right? There, there's a lot of political um, discussions that we need to have as well. Um, but so, if we have some more time, I'd love to come back. I, yeah, I want to, one quick mention is, uh, it's very helpful. I mean, it's, it's helpful for us, but it's a tragedy for what's going on in India. Um, but it's, it's helpful for us in the sense that um, we can use that as a wake up call for, for the people who, can, who believe Trump and believe that the vaccine was a fake a hoax. So like, hey, look, look what can happen to us. And if we don't get vaccinated right now, the virus will mutate and the vaccine will be um, ineffective. So that's, that's, I, I think we're gonna play on that, yeah. Thank you, Tree. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we're, we're seeing the dark sides of, of this pandemic kind of bleed through into our, our consciousness. So I, I appreciate that. Um, all right, so next we're going to move on to uh, Perla and Adriana. I believe, Perla, we're going to start off with you. Do you want to? Sure. Thank you so much. And thank you, um, SVCN and Cadre, for the opportunity to speak here today and for creating this space. So in terms of uh, methodology, um, uh, Community Solutions uses uh, promot the Promotora program, which are basically uh, community educators, and this is um, an, a really a great way to leverage community leaders to increase awareness and access in underserved communities. Um, all of our promotoras are individuals with lived experience, and since we uh, focus really on, on issues of gender-based violence, all of our promotoras have survived either domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and that piece is really helpful because when we talk about some of the the methodologies and some of the challenges that come up. I think it's really important to have community members that understand their community, understand some of the challenges that come up with being perhaps undocumented, not speaking the language, other uh, misinformation. There's a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, in the, in the Latinx community. So having individuals that can speak to that is really important. Um, there was a question specifically about how to get more volunteers. And I think that the, the best way to do that is through compensation. We really want to value our community members' time, and uh, we're very fortunate that the public health department provided community solutions with a grant to do COVID um, outreach specifically in South County because we know that Latinos are um, disproportionately impacted by COVID, but also one of the, the populations that are less likely um, to get vaccinated. So having promotoras that also originally were not uh, very inclined to have the vaccine, but they went through that process and now they can speak to that in the community has really been um, very, very helpful. Um, so for our promotoras, they, they play um, a very versatile world, role in the community. So they can, they're educators. They're also um, can serve as, as liaisons um, back to other organizations. And they can also advocate for the needs of that community. So it's it's really important to see them in, in, a, in a broader role. And I'm gonna turn it over to Adriana, who's gonna talk specifically about the work that promotoras are doing uh, through this grant with, from the public health department to increase awareness about, um, about COVID and the Latinx community, uh, mis, uh, really address some of the, that misinformation that's out there and try to increase the vaccination among the Latinx community. So Adriana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Perla, and thank you, Nick. Um, I, I also want to congratulate right Santa Clara County. They're doing amazing work. 
And um, they work really like together with us to help our promotoras get that information out there. We are, you know, trying to get our Latinx community vaccinated. Um, we, we work every week with the promotoras on um, trying to debunk, right, those myths on getting new information from them, like what, what's, a, what's a conversation out there. So we've done a few things, right? So right now we're focusing on the canvassing from door to door. We have um, canvassed over a thousand homes and um, we've registered over 500 members of the community. And we focus in Gilroy and uh, the Morgan Hill area. So um, yes, in the, in the recent weeks, it's, it's been dwindling down, right? As the vaccinations have become more available. And um, now we're trying to target those hard to get uh, members that really, you know, are having a hard time either, you know, understanding or they just plain don't want to. But um, so we uh, are working with uh, other business partners as well to um, either position ourselves outside of their businesses to uh, be able to uh, contact members that way. Um, and we are also doing some social media outreach. So we did, we called it a vaccination uh, registration fair, right? Where we use our own offices in Gilroy and in Morgan Hill to, um, to be able to refer some of the clients that are already in there, we ask them first, are you vaccinated? If not, you know, are you interested? So we're using that as a resource. They were able to go outside, get the registration done that way. Um, and again, we first, uh, we, uh, we did a big outreach on social media to be able to, to have that event. Um, but we are more successful door to door. And, um, and that's, it. that's the phase we're in. I'm not sure what's happening next, but I know that right now the focus is especially specifically on Latinx, Latinx men. And, um, and that's their focus right now. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, of questions out there about um, the struggles with, with Latinx men. And, and one of them was um, that machismo played a part in it, that uh, Latinx men uh, are saying that, um, that is not, the vaccination is not for men. And I'm not saying it, uh, all Latinx men, but some of the experiences that they've been exposed to, that's, uh, that's one of them. So uh, we're trying to kind of come up with a, a conversation based on that. Uh, there's, a, you know, again, the regular, um, and I don't wanna say the regular, but what Brian mentioned already, why people don't wanna get vaccinated. Um, we try to, inform our promotoras as much as we can. They are given scripts out there, right? So um, they, they can go out there and, and they, again, try to debunk these myths. Uh, and they've been successful many times. And then other times, uh, unfortunately, you know, people just don't, you know, don't want to. So we still refer them here, please, you know, get more informed. It's okay, right? It's okay, I was there too. That's the, that's, that's the awesome part with the promotoras that, they are able to use their life experience and say, I was there too. I got informed. I read about it. This is what I learned. You can learn as well. They, um, they as Perla mentioned, they're known members of the community. So the community trusts them. So I think um, that's been very valuable. They also know, uh, you know, plenty of uh, businesses where underserved community works specifically where they're able to reach out. And that's kind of where we started. So, um, so that's, that's about it for us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And wow, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I didn't even think about, um, you know, gender identity and being, you know, having that play into, you know, people's willingness to take the vaccine as well. You know, it, it, again, it's like any possible reason for people to not get the vaccine. I, I think people are discovering them. So that is incredibly helpful, incredibly insightful. And sorry, uh, I just wanted to add one thing. Besides yeah. that, the other heavy topic was religion. Um, as to why not. And I've had this conversation with Brian and members of uh, Santa Clara County, and they provided some videos in return, but um, that's been another big challenge for us. Absolutely. And I, I remember there is a, a section on, on Brian's slides that we saw regarding um, some misconceptions about the, the ingredients of, of the vaccine, et cetera. So I, these are important messages that we need to get out because like I said, people are finding these reasons. Uh, so this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I did want to pass it over to Jackie next. Uh, Jackie, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, hello, thank you, Nick. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Franco. 
Um, I am a co-owner of Meta, which is a small co cooperative owned business um, that serves primarily here in East San Jose. Uh, but I'm also a promotora and a, a guerrera, we call ourselves for Somos Mayfair um, and the Si Se Puede Collective. Um, again, like our, our work primarily um, has been to, to um, support uh, East San Jose specifically like the Mayfair area um, and uh, three zip codes that have been really impacted by COVID-19. Uh, primarily, I would say uh, Hispanic and Latino and also a, a good population of Vietnamese community. Um, they're really, I think, highlighting a lot of what has been said about hesitancy and, and what we've seen a lot of it has been, you know, religion. Um, we've had people tell us, you know, my church told me not to do it. And so, you know, I'm, you know, as a believer, like I can't just go against my church or what they're telling me or what they're guiding me to do. Um, another thing I think is also uh, has that has played a role has been information. Um, and I, you know, um, people telling us, you know, that they were what they were hearing from, you know, uh, local news or, you know, the TV shows that our parents watch Telemundo and uh, Primer Impacto you know, that they watched for years telling them about the concerns and the scares of what was happening with the vaccine. Um, that'll play a role. And I think something I heard, you know, the, how to relate to it, because I, I, as an immigrant person, an un undocumented person myself, I heard it from my own family. Um, and I think that helped guide um, the conversations and how we approached people um, when we were hearing this from them, right? The hesitancy, the fear. Um, but a lot of the work, like, um, not just around messaging, we've also created videos, um, we've created our own flyers. Um, a lot of the outreach has been done where people are at, meeting people in our community where they are at, um, at diaper distributions, family resource centers. Um, we've been a lot at, you know, grocery stores where we know that, you know, Fridays, Saturdays, we know that there's a lot of people who are there um, and meeting them, being there five, six hours and as much people as we can um, building a relationship with them, I think is the biggest thing that I always tell people that we need to do. There is a distrust. There is a reason to be distressed, um, distrustful of the government. And, you know, uh, we have to acknowledge that if we want to um, continue to, to better that relationship we have. But I always say that, you know, um, my role as a, we call ourselves a, a guerreras, a community warriors. Um, my role as a community warrior is not to convince people or to force people to get the vaccine. It's to create a relationship, a trust, where I can answer their questions, I can make them feel comfortable, um, supply them with the, as much education that I have and information that I have, so that they feel comfortable making that decision themselves. Something that I really think we need to acknowledge is that a lot of our community and our people feel like they don't have control over their lives right now. Um, you know, uh, we can't go out. We, I, had to stop going to work. We have to wear masks. Um, um, you know, like uh, we even had, you know, during the Black Lives Matter, a uh, certain uh, city limit time, right? Like eight o'clock or nine o'clock, I believe we had to be in our houses. And so we heard that a lot from people. They're controlling me. I feel like I don't have a choice. So I really want to uh, amplify that. One of the messagings that we tried that did not work for us um, was when we were, when there was a, a vaccine shortage. And so people wanted to choose what vaccine they wanted to get. And I know the messaging that we had received and we tried to promote was, you know, whatever vaccine is available for you is the best. Um, but in reality, people were saying like, I don't even have a choice over what vaccine I'm gonna get. Like, I, it doesn't, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, thankfully, now that we've had like more vaccine available, people come and they tell me, you know, like I've done my investigation. I wanna get, you know, Pfizer or I wanna get, you know, Moderna, but I don't, I want to feel like I have that choice. And so I think that's very important. Um, for sure, that's one strategy that didn't work for us. And now that we are able to um, make appointments, you know, we know Levi's has Pfizer and Moderna. We know, you know, certain locations have certain vaccines at some times. Um, we've been able to support families in uh, getting the vaccine that they want and that they've chosen that they've done information on, they've done their research on and they know what they want. And so um, that has really helped us when we've done outreach is uh, making people feel like, you know, they have a choice over their bodies, over what they're going to put in it, um, and, and that they're not being forced into doing something that they don't want to do. Um, 
there is still a big hesitancy, hesitancy now. Um, but we're, I feel like we're really making progress. Um, and like I said, I think a lot of the uh, exit, all the success that we've had in Somos and in, in Meta um, is people from the community doing the work um, that they see. I see her, you know, she's my neighbor. She's, um, she goes to my daughter's school. Her son, we, you know, we grew up together being the ones to deliver these messages and information to them. Um, Meta, we've done uh, the door-to-door -door testing. Uh, so since the end of last year, we've been going to people's homes and taking, you know, removing that barrier of accessibility and taking people's, uh, the COVID test, the COVID-19 test. Um, and now we're going back to those same communities and people remember us like, oh yeah, you did my test. And then we're, and we say, yes, we are. We're here to offer the test again. But we're also here to offer you, you know, a vaccine appointment and information about the vaccine. Have you been vaccinated? If so, you know, that's awesome. If not, what, what's your hesitancy? What's your worry about it? So that we can make you, you know, feel more comfortable in making that decision. Um, so again, a lot of work being done, um, so many stories to share, but um, we're just happy to be able to do this work and I'm happy to be able to serve my East San Jose community. Thank you. Jackie, you are a warrior and thank you again for being on the front lines. I think, again, we've heard this message time and time again, time, place, method, right? It's always about being in there in front of people and saying, this is why you need to get vaccinated. These are the, these are the real facts, right? So thank you again for, for doing that. Thank you to your team. Um, our last speaker is going to actually be Kikoa. Koa, uh, do you want to uh, kind of take the reins here? I know we have a few slides for you, right? Um, yeah, I, 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 I was under the impression that you guys would share it and I could just like tell you how to advance or when I to believe advance. so. I'm just covering for Anna to, to, to get her, her slides up. <laughs> okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Keikoa Lopez Paguyo, or you could just call me Koa. Um, I serve as the program coordinator of the Regional Pacific Islander Task Force, or RPITF. Uh, we serve as an advisory council to um, pretty much every public health department across the Bay Area. Um, so, yep, that's me. <laughs> Glad to be here and also to hear from all the um, amazing speakers working in different communities. Um, so kind of, I want to start here, kind of looking at the uh, Pacific Islander COVID-19 uh, cases uh, in the Bay Area. So um, if you look at the blue bar, that's actually the uh, percent of the Pacific Islander population within each county. So what we anticipate or would like to see is actually that the orange bar, which represents the percent of Pacific Islander cases of COVID-19, kind of matches to the percent of the Pacific Islander population within each county. Um, but unfortunately, that's exactly what we do not see here. And we, what we do actually see is that the, the percent of the cases of Pacific Islanders, so the percent of people who um, in the Pacific Islander community who were tested positive for COVID-19, actually dramatically outpaces uh, the percent of the, their share of the population in each county. As you can see, like San Mateo um, has a dramatic um, burden of disease um, that far outpaces the percent of the uh, Pacific Islander population within their county. Um, Santa Clara is a little bit um, similar, but with a smaller proportion size. But um, I just wanted to kind of background um, the Pacific Islander case rates in this way to really um, explain the health disparity that um, the Pacific Islander community is, is um, dealing with with regards to COVID-19, much like the Latinx population, African-American population. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so um, I could also talk about um, Pacific Islander uh, vaccination outcomes. So we're not just doing data surveillance um, at the Regional Pacific Islander Task Force of the COVID-19 health disparities. We are also trying to track our uh, road to health equity, which is um, kind of in mapping um, how each county is doing in vaccine administration. But uh, something that I could point out here that's kind of critical and important is that um, if, if you look at the second to last column, the percent of PI vaccinated, um, three or there's four different counties that are actually reporting disaggregated Pacific Islander vaccinations. Um, and unfortunately though, three out of four of those counties, um, Santa Clara included, are reporting above 100%, uh, which doesn't really make sense. And uh, what, we, what we are kind of realizing is that for small uh, populations like the Pacific Islanders, that uh, miscategorization issues, or perhaps um, if we're 
if our if the denominator of the population that we're using, um, you know, when, when it was measured during the census, if that is actually smaller than what is the reality, um, in which case that would be an undercount of the population size, then we would of course see um, this kind of above 100% vaccination um, percentages that we are seeing today. And something that we noticed that Solana County um, put as a note, um, we decided to adapt. And so we put it on our note up for our table, um, kind of saying that for some counties, uh, the number of individuals who self-identify as Pacific Islander during vaccination is actually higher than the projected uh, population uh, as measured in the census. So essentially what that's saying is that um, it could have been an underestimation of the PI population size during the census, or perhaps that more Pacific Islanders today are self-identifying as Pacific Islanders than when the population was actually measured. So just, a just pointing out there that there's a lot of uh, difficulty in getting good data for the Pacific Islander population. Um, so that's something that we are contending with. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our approach to kind of dealing with um, the different disparities in health um, within the Pacific Islander community um, with regards to COVID-19 outcomes is really trying to address um, COVID-19 vaccine um, access points uh, within each county. So the way that we're doing this is really partnering with uh, different Pacific Islander organizations that are serving uh, throughout the Bay Area. So that includes the Pacific Islander Wellness Initiative, um, Taulama for Tongans in San Mateo, even like um, Samoan Community Development Center in San Francisco. But beyond just the Pacific Islander CBOs that we're kind of working with um, as part of the task force, we're also kind of working with different Pacific Islander faith-based groups um, so like the CCCS Oakland, which is a um, Samoan church, as well as Tafatolu in um, San Jose. So we're actually working with uh, different Pacific Islander uh, uh, faith-based groups to kind of partner with uh, different departments of public health to see if we could uh, pop up a um, vaccine pod or that type of model within their churches. So, Because that does a lot to um, signal um, trustworthiness to the Pacific Islanders that attend these churches and who call themselves congregants. Um, so this um, strategy has been working tremendously. Uh, we have, um, you know, just five to 10 uh, organizational staff and then about 20 or so uh, community organizers from the, di from the different Pacific Islander communities, uh, much like, like um, the Asian population. Uh, Pacific Islanders are not a monolith and th thus we have different languages and so we, we have um, many of our communities uh, ha being led by um, different Pacific Islander subgroup leaders so like the Fijians, the Tongans, the Samoans, uh, each having their own um, language supports to give out to the community members to help navigate them to a vaccine. Um, next slide please. So as I was saying before, a lot of this takes uh, faith-based partnerships, but also some of it actually involves um, inter-community partnerships. So we partnered with like La Familia, as well as Glad Tidings Church, um, serving the black community, and then also the um, La Familia with the Latinx community. Because it takes a lot of um, joint efforts to really target the uh, most marginalized, most disenfranchised and most, mar um, the people with like less access points to a vaccine um, compared to other populations. So um, this partnership work, you know, it takes a lot of efforts to lift up, lift up but just showing that we're not doing this alone um, with just the Pacific Islander community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to reiterate, we actually had a vac multiple vaccine events at uh, Tafatalu Church in Santa Clara County. Um, they've been ongoing and we've been really proud to kind of uh, reach different Pacific Islanders with different uh, processes uh, to make sure that they've been, they're allowed to be served with a vaccination. So we built a lot of accountability points to make sure that um, uh, we're, we're not just popping up this site um, at a Pacific Islander church without being accountable to serve the Pacific Islander congregants there. Um, so we're very proud and that's been an ongoing effort the past couple months. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, the task force has been involved with uh, food distribution. Uh, we deliver healthy food boxes to the many different uh, faith-based churches to then distribute to their congregants uh, in a pickup-based model, uh, with one of our sites actually in Alameda County also serving as a testing, ongoing testing site as well as a vaccine site recently. So we're trying to um, 
just compile all the different layered resources and make sure that they're all kind of accessible um, at different sites as well as trustworthy. Next slide. And just to kind of end on a community testimonial note, um, someone that we recently sort of onboarded as a, a, a community leader was um, Maya Ito in the uh, Palauan community, uh, which is a subgroup of the Microne Micronesian um, ethnic diaspora, which is part of the Pacific Islander umbrella. But just, um, just her involvement has been, you know, sent ripple effects throughout the um, Palauan uh, community members uh, who have sent her a lot of thanks for her involvement in, de in delivering uh, food boxes to their families. So just going to show how much uh, food distribution has really improved community trust in us as an organization, which has led us to um, really do a lot of the good outreach work as well with regards to vaccines. Because um, as a lot of the uh, promotores uh, speakers have really noted that like we need to kind of phrase these things as an option that the vaccine is a choice it's a very personal choice and we want our community members to feel like they're comfortable to ask ask us any questions um, to clarify anything and, and to improve their vaccine readiness confidence and trust um, i think that's it for me thank you so much thank you Tikoa, and and thank you for all this really wonderful information obviously um every community needs to 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 be involved with this um i, I believe we're going to jump back to Jennifer. So Jennifer, do you want to kind of take over? Sure. Thank you all so much. I love to hear what our different community organizations are doing because it takes you. You're the ones who are doing all of the work and I thank you all so very much. And so just like we heard, our community partners have talked about the work they have done and continue to do. You heard that they're providing resources on websites, they're knocking on doors, they're canvassing neighborhoods, they're meeting the community where they are, and they're building relationships. You, as the trusted nonprofits in our county, I'm calling on you. Jackie said she's a community warrior. What I'm asking you is that you join in on this fight also. We as a county, we can not only do so much. We can provide you with the resources and the information. You can tell us what messages you need. We can do a flyer for you, but we need you. We need you to provide the information, dispel the myths, give community, your community, a chance to make the most educated choices for themselves. So I call on you to have the conversations and leverage your existing relationships. And as Dr. Marty has always said, the first million, that was easy. The next group, if we're going to reach them, it's going to take you and your organization to also become a community warrior in this fight against COVID. So. Thank you all so much for joining us. If there are any other questions, then I'll pass it back to Anna. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. So if there are any other questions that you have of any of our speakers or presenters today, please feel free to use the chat box as we go through a couple of final housekeeping um, before we get to the end of today's program. So next steps and closing comments, a few things to share with you. Uh, there's a flyer on the left side of your screen that Andre shared with us that will be posted along with the recording of today's program and the PowerPoint decks to, <coughs> excuse me, our website. The other is um, there is a very similar uh, series of workshops that's being hosted in San Francisco also to build vaccine confidence. So if you or your colleagues have, um, would like to take advantage of similar conversations, the information for that is also being made available to you on screen. Um, to keep our funders happy, um, we do want to request uh, your feedback uh, via the um, survey monkey. There's a QR code. The way you do this is hold up your camera of your phone to that uh, QR code and it'll immediately bring you to a very brief, less than five minute survey. And um, if you don't want to do that right now, we'll go ahead and send you the Survey Monkey link immediately following today's session um, with the PowerPoints as well. Um, so, as I said before, the recording of today's session, the PowerPoints and resources will all be uploaded. Um, and I already said that. So, let me turn it to Nick for our final closing comments. Thank you so much. And um, a big special shout out to our cadre uh, team. Uh, Anna and Marcia, you guys did above and beyond what we needed to get this thing together. Um, I, 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 I call it logistics mojo, logistics magic. You guys have it and you guys did it. So 
Thank you so much for that. Again, a big round of applause to our speakers, uh, our the county staff who came out. Thank you so much for such a strong showing. This is exactly the kind of uh, thing we need right now. I need a confidence builder. There's too much bad news. We've had too much bad news. I'm sick of bad news. It's time to say what we can do. We can move together. We can move together as a family, as a unit. And this is what we're gonna do. We just need to know how to talk to our family and we need to bring it up. So remember, think about the conversations you're having. Engage, volunteer, do what you can to help out. We know this is a monumental effort, but we will come through together. So thank you again for attending and we hope to see you soon out there on the front lines as, as warriors arm in arm. So thank you very much for being here today. We'll talk to you all soon.